my dear students welcome to the course of architecture and town planning i am your teacher ravinder kumar khyani assistant professor department of architecture and planning nid university of engineering and technology karachi sin pakistan today the topic of our discussion is location of public and semi public buildings civic centers commercial centers local shopping centers and public schools in a city how in town planning we should locate these uh, different kinds of buildings let's have an introduction in city you find variety of uh, buildings in order to understand the theme of current lecture it is imperative to identify the meaning and interpretation of the terms location and its theory public and semi public building types the civic center the commercial center the local shopping center and public schools whereas it is also important to clearly spell out the activity generated via these building types and where these activities be located within within an urban context and the following all these issues are discussed in detail what are the public and semi public buildings the public buildings are any type of buildings that is accessible to the public and is funded from public sources typically public buildings are funded through tax money by the federal provincial and local government all types of governmental offices are considered public buildings public buildings generally serve the purpose of providing a service to the public many of these services are provided free to citizens however currently state takes charges for service provision the city hall schools libraries court houses post offices are few examples of public buildings then the semi public building zone includes all the civic spaces surrounding a public building as well as the building facade or elevation the entrance and ground floors and it's managed by the building manager or their service provider here you can see a difference between the public zone the semi public zone and the semi private zone in a building uh, typology well locating and grouping the public and semi public building the locating and grouping the public and semi public building is a difficult and complex task because many factors controls their location convenience and accessibility of users are the main criteria for their location it is important that building should be counted for their full value and should not be in sordid surroundings that drags down or hide them the prime approach and connectivity to public transport is another consideration for locating and grouping public and semi public buildings here you can see how the buildings and semi public and semi public buildings are located thus the location of public and semi public buildings in the city shall be at the central place the accessibility of all citizens and availability of public and private transport may be assured the public buildings with interrelated functions should be located near to each other this is an example of the municipal uh, court and the public parkway in st louis here you can see the public and semi public buildings in different cities located uh, within uh, in a grouping what is a civic center a civic center is a prominent land area within a community that is constructed to be its focal point or center of the city it is usually contains one or more dominant public buildings which may also include a government building recently the term civic center has been used in reference to an entire central business district of a community or a major shopping center in the middle of a community in this type of civic center special attention is paid to the way building structures or public structures are grouped and landscaped in american cities the multi purpose arena is named as civic center that is columbus civic center such civic centers combine venues for sporting events theaters concerts and similar events then here you can see the civic center in miami florida united states locating a civic center where civic center should be located civic centers in uk are a focus for local government offices and public service offices or public service buildings in australia civic center is used as a brand of a shopping center 
In case of Karachi, the civic center is a building located in the center of the city and contains activities such as municipal institution, the development authority or KGA, the utility institutions, water, electricity, gas, the banks, the airline offices, the city district government head office and expo center to serve the people of Karachi. Here you can see the civic center Karachi is building and the expo center is plan and elevation. Based on these different characteristics of civic center in different countries, the locational criteria varies as per context. Thus, civic center must be centrally located in city where they are accessible from all parts of the city at equal distance if possible. What is a commercial center? The commercial centers are also called downtown, the central business district or the urban villages. In a, it contains a concentration of business, civic and cultural activities, creating conditions that facilitate interaction and exchange among people. This increases the overall accessibility to the place. Vibrant commercial centers have following attributes. First, there should be density and clustering. The commercial center should have medium to high density with multi-story buildings. The densities of 50 employees or more per gross acre are desirable. The ground floor of building should have activities and services that involve frequent public interaction that include the retail business, the professional services, the civic offices with office or residential activities above which creates an attractive street environment while accommodating the dense employment for the people. Then there should be diversity. Commercial center contain a diverse mix of offices and the retail space, banks and law offices, public institutions, for example, city hall, court houses, government offices, entertainment and art activities and other suitable industries for the people. So there should be diverse kinds of buildings. Increasingly, a commercial center also have a residential building either within or nearby the commercial center. Then local and the regional importance. The commercial center should contain significant portion of total regional employment and business activity. Then there should be an attribute of walkability in this. Most commercial centers are less than 250 acres in size so all destinations are within above 10 minutes walk. With good sidewalks and pathways, the pedestrian shortcuts, attractive streetscape, pedestrian scale and orientation, and relatively narrow streets are required, that is four lanes or less, less desirable. Relatively slow vehicle traffic, that is 30 miles per hour or less is desirable in the commercial centers. Then there should be a universal design, accessible for all the people having imperatives of any kind, any physical imperative, like seeing or you know, walking, and a high degree of pedestrian security. The pedestrian can move freely, whether men, women, children, or old people. Then there should be transportation diversity in the commercial center. The area should be accessible by walking, cycling, taxi, automobile, and the public transit, whether bus or mass transit. Then there should be parking management within the uh, commercial centers or city centers in order to avoid the need to devote a large portion of land to parking. The commercial centers require that parking be managed for efficiency. It is often appropriate to use structured or underground parking and to limit the total amount of parking in a commercial center. Then there are transit oriented development. This refers to such districts designed with features that facilitate transit accessibility with maximum uh, developing within the convenient walking distance of attractive transit station that may be an underground uh, railway or you can say bus, uh, for example, Sampras Market have this uh, status of transit oriented development. There are many types of commercial centers ranging from downtowns or CBDs which are primarily commercial centers. A vibrant commercial center contains a medical and dental services, gyms for exercise, daycare facilities, the conference centers, the hotels, and a type of meeting facilities. And that is very important for the 
overall commercial life of the people. Locating a commercial center. In order to locate a commercial center, there are following prerequisites. Number one, it must not be located in the midst of residential area. The city planners or town planners or urban engineers encourage businesses to congregate along business, busier streets and central downtown areas. Some areas of the city may be designated for mixed uses where residential and commercial should be mixed, which means some commercial areas may be used for the residential purposes. The commercial center shall be located where high level of accessibility is ensured for the people, whether pedestrian accessibility or vehicular accessibility. The transportation diversity is another requisite to locate the commercial centers. A parking management is also required near the commercial center and there should be walking, cycling and public transit modes are needed for commercial centers to be successful. Finally, the commercial center must be located near the places of entertainment and recreation. Now let's talk about what is a local shopping center. A local shopping center is a building or set of buildings which contains retail units with interconnecting walkways enabling visitors to easily walk from one unit to another. In the United Kingdom, these are called retail parks, out-of-town shopping centers, or precincts, precincts. The term shopping center is used in Europe and Australia. However, shopping mall is used in North America. Malls in Ireland are very small shopping centers placed in the center of the town. Shopping centers in the United Kingdom refer to as shopping precincts or town centers. A strip mall or shopping plaza or mini mall is an open area shopping center where the stores are arranged in a row with the sidewalk in front. Here are some examples. These are the examples of local shopping centers. Such as in London, you can see this Burlington Arcade and there is Express Avenue in Chennai, the Avia Park in Moscow, the Lamdia Sok Syria, the uh, Chester Rose in Cheshire, the Hongyeon Mall, Shanghai, the Marshi des Efons Rooks in Paris, the Passage du Cre, Paris, the Shahi Bazaar, Larkana, the Isfahan Bazaar, Tehran, the Toronto Eaton Centre, the Grand Bazaar, Istanbul, the Robinson Place, Manila, the Tokyo Shopping Arcade, and Galleria Vittoria, Milan. So you can see there are so much similarities in the local shopping centre. The locating of a local shop center is very tricky business. Look at this. The shopping centers are distinctly different from the downtown or local business strips. The shopping center building is pre-planned as a merchandising unit for interplay among tenants. Its site is deliberately selected by the developer for easy access to pull customers from a trade area. It has on-site parking as a common feature of the layout. The amount of parking space is directly related to the retail area and customers like the shopping center's convenience. In examining any shopping center, location get answers to questions such as these. Are there enough customers in vicinity to run the business? Are there enough buyers of shops or renters? Will it be a affordable market for people in proximity? What is the condition of a nearby market? For example, will it be a trendsetter or give competition to existing shopping? And if you get the satisfactory answer, that is the proper location for locating a shopping center. Here are some examples of Janam Market and Empress Market and Jama Class Market, Bhadrabad Chorangi in Karachi. Let's go ahead. Then comes the issue of location of a public school. The main the term public school has two distinct and virtually opposite meanings. In United States, Australia and Canada, public school is funded from a tax revenue and most commonly administered by a local government. 
In the United Kingdom and Commonwealth countries, public school is a traditional privately operated secondary school which requires the payment of fees for its pupils and is often a boarding school. These schools, wherever located, often follow a British educational tradition and are committed in the principle to public accessibility. Originally, many were single-sex boarding schools, but most independent schools are now co-education. The school districts are special purpose districts authorized by the provisions of the state law in UK and USA. The location of public school may vary in each context and located within the city center areas or in the outskirts of the city in more natural environment so as the youth would have a healthy environment. Since we are studying the location of different buildings and spaces within the city, it is important now to look at a small video about center place theory. This theory is about how housing or how settlements develop in a city. Central Place Theory The Central Place Theory was developed by a German geographer named Walter Christaller in 1933. He developed the Central Place Theory by studying settlements in southern Germany to understand how urban settlements are developed and spaced out in relation to each other. The central place theory is explained using connected hexagons. The central place theory does not use circles or squares because circles have an equal distance from center to edge, but they overlap or leave gaps. Squares connect together without gaps, but their sides are not equal from the center. Geographers use hexagons to de depict the market area of a good or service because hexagons offer a compromise between geometric properties of circles and squares. The central place theory is based off the concepts of range, Threshold and hinterland. Range is the maximum distance people are willing to travel to use a service. Threshold is the minimum number of people needed to support a service. Hinterland is the area surrounding the city that interacts with the market in regards to the service. Due to range of central goods and service varies, tertiary centers are arranged in an orderly hierarchy. Metropolises offer all services associated with central places and have large hinterlands. Medium-sized settlements have the same goods and services as villages and hamlets offer, but only some of those that cities offer. At the bottom are small market villages and roadside hamlets that may contain nothing more than a post office service station or cafe. Each high-ranked central place offers all goods and services of the next lower-ranked place, plus at least one or two more. Crucial to his theory, different goods and services vary both in threshold and range. Assumptions For example, larger number of people is required to support a hospital, university, or department store is greater than a gasoline station, post office, or grocery store. Also, people are willing to travel further to consult a heart specialist in regards to land title or purchase a car than to buy a loaf of bread or mail letter. All central places are part of a system counterparts spread in equal area, evenly distributed population and resources, countryside areas he studied will be flat so no barriers would exist to interfere with people's movements across it, humans will always purchase goods closest to the place that, that offers it, whenever demand for a certain good is high, it will be offered in close proximity to the population, whenever demand drops so does availability, consumers have the same income level and shopping behavior as similar purchasing power and demand for goods and services. In conclusion, the central place theory was used to describe the size and distribution of settlements. So you have seen how central place theory is applied in different settlements and the shopping center or anything that you are going to locate within a city is based on this theory. Finally, it is very important for us since we are discussing the locations of different uh, activities within buildings, it is very interesting to see why cities are located where they are. So it is, this video is about the cities and their location. Valley is home to six towns lying between Hagerstown, Maryland and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Greencastle, Chambersburg, Shippensburg, Newville, Carlisle, and Mechanicsburg. What's exceptional about these small Pennsylvania towns is that they're each almost exactly 10 miles from each other. 
the distances deviate by no more than a mile from this rule. This isn't a coincidence and this isn't planned. Drawing equal sized radii around each town shows you their spheres of influence. Assuming each town has the exact same shops and services, rational people will go to whichever town is closest to buy or sell goods. Towns 10 miles apart mean that nobody has to travel more than 5 miles to reach a town. Each one of these towns was founded before the formation of the United States, so that means that, of course, nobody had cars, and pretty much everybody walked everywhere. 10 miles, or 5 miles each way, is about the distance a person can comfortably walk in a day with enough time to buy or sell goods at a central market. Back in this era before cars, a 5 mile radius was essentially the largest possible commuter zone to small agricultural towns, and therefore having towns 10 miles apart was the most efficient possible use of rural land. When you get the chance, take a look at a map of a rural area that existed before cars, you'll see that the distance between medium-sized towns is almost always somewhere between about 10 to 15 miles. Because the Cumberland Valley is a valley, towns really could only develop in a line, but in most cases, towns develop in all directions. This is what the 10-mile rule looks like when going out in all directions. Each of these points is a town, and the hexagon around it is the area from which people will go to the town. In the real world, each of these towns probably has a small grocery store, a pharmacy, a bank, and maybe a restaurant. Since everybody uses these services, there doesn't have to be many people in a town's sphere of influence in order to sustain these shops. But where do you put something more specialized, like a mechanic? People only need to go to the mechanic every once in a while, so you need more people to sustain one mechanic shop than one grocery store. Well, some of these small towns develop into larger towns with more people that can support more specialized shops and services. Putting these larger towns with more specialized shops closer together would be unsustainable, since there wouldn't be enough people going to those shops. But putting them farther apart would be inefficient since there's land that people would not go to a city from. This happens once or twice more until you have cities. These cities have the largest spheres of influence and the most specialized shops. You of course still have grocery stores and pharmacies in cities, but you also have things like luxury car dealerships, brain surgery centers, and airports. The city's sphere of influence is enormous because people will travel hundreds of miles to buy an expensive car or get brain surgery or fly from an airport. Think about it within a city. How far would you walk to buy a latte? Probably only a few blocks. And that's why you see Starbucks or other coffee shops on almost every block. Since almost everyone buys coffee, you only need a few blocks of people to sustain one coffee shop. But how far would you walk to buy a MacBook? Probably quite far, since it's an infrequent and substantial purchase. That's why Apple stores are rather rare, even in cities. You need an enormous amount of people to sustain one Apple store, and we can actually figure out roughly how many. In Connecticut, the Trumbull Apple Store is about 20 miles away from the New Haven Store to the northeast and the Stanford Store to the southwest. <clears throat> in the 10 mile radius around the Trumbull Apple Store, there are about half a million inhabitants, which tells us that you need about half a million people to sustain one Apple Store. We can compare that to the Starbuckses of Lower Manhattan, which are spread out at an average distance of about 600 feet. Drawing a 300 foot radius around one Starbucks in Lower Manhattan covers about 6,000 people which means that one Starbucks needs 6,000 people to sustain it. Of course, both Connecticut and New York are places with higher than average incomes, which means that less people are needed to sustain one Starbucks or Apple store. The numbers would be very different in, say, rural Kansas. But since each store generally only builds in areas with higher than average incomes, this gives a good sense of how many people Apple and Starbucks look for in an area before opening up a store. So our model shows where cities should be, but it's not like this in reality. This is the most efficient spread of cities. If you're assuming that cities are on a perfectly flat plane with no geographic features, no social influences, no variability of income, equal distribution of resources, essentially assuming the world is one homogeneous place, which it's not. In reality, of course, our world has an enormous effect on where and why cities develop. To start out, let's cut this down to one city on a flat, featureless plane for simplicity. What affects the location of cities more than anything is water. If we put an ocean on one side of our isotropic plane, our city will almost certainly locate near it. Oceans have always been and still are what connects the world. 
there's no other means of transport that can move such enormous amounts of cargo for so little. Any city needs to be economically efficient to grow, and it will cost more to bring goods to a city that's a thousand miles inland than one right by the ocean. Just look at Europe. Six of the ten largest European cities are within 100 miles of the coast. But oceans aren't the only bodies of water to affect cities. Rivers are just as or perhaps even more influential. Milan, the 19th largest European city, is the largest to not be either directly on the ocean or on a river. And even then, it's only 15 miles from a river and 75 miles from the ocean. Until the last century or so, cities could not survive without direct water access. If you need more proof, 14 of the 15 largest cities in the world are within a few dozen miles of the ocean. Perhaps the most obvious attractor for cities is resources. So going back to our isotropic plane, putting natural resources anywhere on this map will draw cities near it. Cities that existed before the last century or so generally sprung up right near the resources, much like Pittsburgh, since they acted as manufacturing and transportation hubs for those resources. But more recently, new resource-dependent cities don't need to be as close to the resources themselves. New transportation technologies can bring the resources from their source. Just look at Dubai. Of course the UAE has enormous oil deposits, but they're much closer to Abu Dhabi and the southwest than Dubai. In 1900, Dubai had 10,000 residents, less than half that of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, one of the farming towns we talked about at the beginning. That only grew to 40,000 by 1960, but today it's known worldwide and has more than 2.5 million residents. It was able to grow at this enormous rate, even faster than Abu Dhabi, since it cemented itself as the economic and administrative hub for the oil industries of the region. Another geographic feature that we can add to the plane is mountains. Now, mountains don't always have a uniform effect on cities. Mexico City, Bogota, and Addis Ababa are all enormous cities at elevations above 7,000 feet. Mountains do make transport and trade difficult, but they also provide protection. Many ancient cities grew in these locations since they were easy to protect, which left more time to focus on growing the city. But mountains can also hinder development. For quite a while, the United States could not develop west of the Appalachian Mountains. They just served as an enormous barrier. In 1800, the average <coughs> center of population for the entire United States was here, even though the U.S. had sovereignty over this entire area. Of course, technology eventually conquered this barrier and moved the mean population center all the way out to Missouri today. But if the Appalachian Mountains didn't exist, American history and geography would be completely different. We would have seen urban development much earlier in the Midwest. But mountains can also have another effect. You see, coal, silver, gold, and other mineral deposits are all often located in mountainous regions. And just like Dubai, cities can develop in less hospitable and easy places due to resources. The economic advantage of exploiting the resources overpowers the economic disadvantage of being in an inhospitable location. Denver, Colorado grew 650% between 1870 and 1880 with the opening of a railroad branch connecting with the Transcontinental Railroad. It served as an access point to transportation to the gold miners in the Rockies. So, mountains can either push cities away or bring them nearer. It really just depends on the circumstance. Let's exchange our isotropic plane for a world map. Where should cities be on here? Well. Our world's cities are not necessarily in all the most geographically efficient locations. While there is a certain level of natural selection that grows the efficiently placed cities and shrinks the inefficiently placed cities, humans are not always able to put cities in the most efficient locations. Let's put up the 224 cities in the world with a population over 2 million. You can immediately see some patterns. Putting up the equator, you can see there's a clear divide. Only 32 of these cities lie in the southern hemisphere. One might think that this is because there is so much more land in the northern hemisphere. But that's not entirely true. You see, the southern hemisphere still has 32% of the world's land, but only has 14% of the world's large cities. There's clearly a higher density of cities in the northern hemisphere. You can pretty much trace this all back to Europe and Asia. The first large civilizations and empires were on these two continents even though the human race likely originated in Africa. There's hundreds of different theories on why civilizations succeeded in some places and failed in others, 
But one of the more plausible and interesting theories is that Europe and Asia succeeded because they're wide instead of tall. The very shape of continents may have changed the course of human history. You see, when a continent is wide, you have a ton of land with roughly the same climate. Climate tends to change when you go north and south rather than east and west, as a nature of how the earth rotates around the sun. Much of the success of early civilizations had to do with the domestication of plants and animals and the corresponding technology. When expanding horizontally, the climate is similar enough that an empire can use the same successful plants and animals, while expanding vertically requires the domestication of new plants and animals. If a civilization started in Central America, for example, there would be very little land on the continent with a similar climate and their expansion would be severely limited. In Europe and Asia, on the other hand, there's thousands upon thousands of miles of similar climate that can be reached just by traveling east or west. Just look at the maps of the four largest early empires, the Qing Dynasty, the Abbasid Caliphate, the Umayyad Caliphate, and the Mongol Empire. They were all in Eurasia and they all expanded horizontally. When some of the more modern empires expanded, they had the technology to do so overseas. The three major modern empires were the British, Spanish, and French empires, each of which came from relatively similar climates. A major reason why America was able to succeed is because all the agriculture from Europe worked there. Climactically, Europe and America are nearly identical. The majority of developed colonized countries are in the Northern Hemisphere just because they were closest to Europe but formerly British countries like South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand are all highly developed and in the Southern Hemisphere. Their success over more Northern countries in the Southern Hemisphere can also be partially attributed to their greater climate similarity to Europe. Let's ask one more question. If our world only had one city, where would it logically be? Well, if you take the location of every person in the world and average it out, you come to South Central Asia. That means that this general region is the optimum place to live on the planet. But where more specifically should our world city go? Well, this region is already in the Northern Hemisphere and in Eurasia, so we've already covered those two criteria. We want a place within 100 or so miles of the ocean, on a navigable river, near mountains with rich mineral deposits. The single best place for a city on Earth just might be Dhaka, Bangladesh. Every geographic model and theory says that there is no better place on Earth to put a city than here. There's evidence to back this up. Dhaka is between the 4th and the 18th largest metropolitan area on Earth, depending on how you define metropolitan area, and Bangladesh is the 6th densest country on Earth. There are 161 million people living in an area of about the size of England. History has affected geography enough that the largest and most advanced civilizations are not all in South Central Asia. But if we started all over again, did humanity a second time, every geographic model says that this region could be the origin and central point of human civilization. So I believe you may have understood why cities are located where they are currently. And now it is time to end this class. Thank you very much for uh, learning. Well, that's it. I just uh, finished my lecture here. These are the references for the lecture. Thanks for watching. For lecture notes, visit my blog, www.tauntanglectures.blogspot.com. Thank you very much for learning all about the location of public and semi-public buildings, civic centers, commercial centers, local shopping centers, and public schools. Hasta la vista and Lucio Gracias Estudiantes.